Hi, my name is Keith Cooper from North Light Images and in this video I'm going to run through a review of a new lens from Lauer. It's a 20mm shift lens. Now its full title is the 20mm F4C Dreamer. Um, it's a 20mm lens, manual lens, but it's a shift lens. Now, if you're unsure of what shift lens do, why you would use them or anything like that, I've got lots of videos that look at tilt and shift lenses, this one's shift only. Um, and also I've written lots of articles and I've got a book that goes into details of how you might want to use lenses. Now the lens itself, here it's shown attached to an EOS RP, which is a camera I tested on. It's the one I'm shooting this on as well. The lens itself is a nice hefty lens. It's all metal construction. There are no bits that give any impression they're gonna break in a hurry. Um, now, if you're concerned about weight, then probably tilt and shift lenses are not something you're gonna be worried about overly. I'm, I would rather have a hefty solid lens than something I thought was gonna break or shift. Now, the lens itself, fully manual. So I've got a focus here. Uh, focus throw is about 90 degrees. It could do with being a little more to make the focusing a bit smoother, but I'm not really a quibble on that. Um, gone are the days when uh, lenses would have a near 360 degree focus throw. Um, it just doesn't happen anymore. The lens itself, take off as a lens cap for it, is internal focusing, which means that the front element doesn't move at all. It can take filters, 82 millimeter filter size. Now, the lens itself is, as I said, a shift lens. And shift lenses have all kinds of uses, which is, I'll show some examples in a bit. Um, it, it's a vital sort of lens for my work as doing interior photography, architectural photography. And I can see this one, which has a list, I believe, of around about $1,100, will sell well. This is an ideal focal length for interiors, and uh, it's very easy to use. Now, the shift itself is an ingenious mechanism. It's not the usual sort of little knob on the side that you adjust. It's a big ring here that you rotate and the lens shifts backwards and forwards. There is a, sh a scale on the side which gives the amount of shift. Now, the amount of shift here is a maximum of 11 millimeters in either direction. The version I've got here, as I said, is the RF mount. It's also available in Nikon Z and F mounts. It's available in EF mount for Canon as well. So you could use it on DSLRs. It's also about Sony E, Pentax, Fuji G, which should interest a lot of people uh, with uh, Fuji GFX cameras, and does, and there's an L mount as well. Now, the difference between the lenses is purely in this bottom bit. Here. The length of this effectively is whatever is needed for the particular mount. So for this, the RF mount version, it's quite a long tube and it is just a tube. There's no optics in this bit here. The optics are the same between each lens, each different version for different mounts. So the EF version will be shorter and lighter. Uh, just depends on the yeah, camera mount that you have and what the flange distances of the mount, uh, it'll vary. There should be no difference between operation of any of them because they're all exactly the same internally in terms of the optics. The only slight difference I would notice is that if you are using the Nikon F mount version, the Nikon F mount is quite a narrow mount. It's quite a narrow throat size on it. That's more likely to lead to a little bit, and it is, would only be a little bit of shift vignetting. Um, that's a problem of the small F mount. The Z mount, for example, much bigger. All the other mounts should be okay. Don't know about the Pentax mount though, and how that will work out for it. But the effect will be minimal. But uh, certainly with this, it's not there at all. Now, I go into details of aberrations and uh, lens performance to some extent in the actual written review, because uh, mainly because I can edit that and change details as a result of testing. The videos are just meant as, really as an overview of what you're getting. So there's the lens. Um, the specs itself, the only thing I'd notice on the specs, it's quite a complex uh, lens. It has 16 elements 
in 11 groups. So there's a lot of glass in here as well. Uh, it's quite a complex design and um, works very well. Even as just as a straightforward 20 millimeter lens, no issues whatsoever. Now, the back end of the lens, you'll notice there are no electrical contacts. That's because the lens, when I said it was a manual lens, it is, it is fully manual. As far as the camera's concerned, it doesn't even know that there's a lens fitted because there's no electronics to tell it. Now, that's not a problem, but you may need to set some cameras to be able to fire the shutter with no lens attached because effectively, this is no lens from the camera's point of view, there's no electronics. No electronics also means you've got no EXIF data about the lens, so no aperture information and certainly no distance information or information about the amount of shift that's been applied. Now, no shift lenses that I know of currently produce EXIF data regarding the amount of shift, so that's not a big problem. But you are shooting fully manually. If you are not used to using manual lenses, then look forward to a bit of a learning curve. I'm going to say that taking time to use a lens, learn to use a lens and shooting fully manually will do nothing but benefit your photography. Now, if you want to try and do it for just normal, fast day-to-day -day moving photography where you're using AF and things like that, then you're going to have a bit of work doing it. But you can, you can shoot perfectly well without autofocus. Um, just, you know, if you make a lot of use of autofocus, think about how you're going to use a lens like this. It does make a difference. Now, the front element of the lens doesn't move, it's fixed, it's fully internally focusing, and it takes an 82 millimeter screw filter size. Uh, the filter thread here needs, if you're going to use much shift, needs relatively low profile filters. I haven't tested this extensively, but I would suspect that if you're not careful, your filters may well produce a little bit of vignetting at full shift. Now that's only really at full shift and uh, you'll have no problem using them. Of course, you could use filters at the back. If you've got the EF version, you could have the EF to RF adapter that intakes filters inside. You can pop a polarizer in it there. Um, I don't use filters very often, certainly with lenses like this, but you can try it out. Now, the top here, we have an interesting lens hood. Normal lens hoods just clip into place and that's it. This particular lens hood has a locking key, a locking nut on the side of it to hold it in place. When it's in place, there's your normal lens hood. The lens hood rotates by click stops at 15 degree click stops. Now the 15 degree click stops match up the 15 degree settings that you can rotate the whole lens. So the lens can be rotated on the mount so that your shift axis can be varied. So you could have shift this way, you could have shift that way, you could have any direction you like and that's where you set it at the back here. However the lens hood also shifts round. The reason for that is that at full shift if you're not careful, if you haven't moved the lens hood from its default setting you will get some vignetting. Now fortunately this is really easy to spot, it's quite obvious with a short focal length lens like this so you can use it if you spot the vignetting, if you've got a lot of shift one direction you just turn the lens hood round. It still works um, and it's worthwhile keeping there. The lens hood, why work with the lens hood? Well, any lens like this, complex lens like this, will not like sunshine shining on it brightly. Um, it will cause problems inside uh, with reflections and stuff. Now, the flare and uh, lens quality you get out of this, it's pretty good. Um, one of the things I would say about this lens is I noticed that it's geometric distortions are very low indeed. This is an image shifted upwards of a building and I've got lots of these images like this in the written review which you can look at in more detail. And this is taken at I believe at about an f8 and there is a slight bit of sun reflection here and you can see the star effect on it from uh, the spikes on it. The aperture of this is a 14 blade aperture it's a rounded blade, so it doesn't produce very prominent star spikes. It will, uh, almost any lens will, if you, get, if you stop it down a bit, um, the 
aperture ring itself not being perfectly circular will just produce these little spikes and they're there it's not a significant problem if you've looked at the lower 15 millimeter it has a different five blade aperture and that gives a very distinct star spike effect and that's really quite noticeable um, I would say almost with a 15, for some uses, it's too noticeable. So you have to be careful with your setup when you're using that lens. But 15 mm shift lens, it's a very wide lens. It's a good lens. In terms of image quality, this one is a distinct step up from the 15, which you'd expect because a 15 shift lens is a much more difficult optical design to achieve than the 20 millimeter here. So this is a better quality. Chromatic aberration, it's almost invisible uh, and easily fixable even with shifted images using something like Adobe Camera Raw. When you process your raw files, switch on the auto correction and it will correct it. Now, I mentioned there was no EXIF data. That means that uh, Camera Raw and other processing software doesn't know what lens it is, it doesn't know what shift it is, so you can't apply automatic corrections to images here. Now, not a problem. There is relatively low vignetting once you move away from f4. At f4, you can see, yes, there's a bit of vignetting uh, in the field. If you're shifted, then obviously that's offset, but it's easy to see. And so I've got examples of these. Have a look at the written review if you want more details on this. But it's very easy to fix. By 5.6, it's minimal. By f8, it's difficult to see. And by f11, with strong shift, which you probably would be using to get detail in the corners here, there's no real problems with it at all. Um, but I would say that if you're using strong shift and you are putting detail in the corners, do check your focusing carefully and check your aperture setting. You will need a smaller aperture for that just because of the amount of shift. There's detail of the star spikes from the other picture. Uh, they're really not that prominent. As I say, almost any lens I would expect to get some effect like this off. If you do get sun on the front element, the lens is quite resistant to flare. Um, it's pretty good for the amount of glass that's inside it. it suggests the coatings work well, as yeah, the design as well. Um, if you're not using the lens hood here and you think the sun's in your shot, well, I, I just often just use my hand in the picture just to stop the sun hitting the front element. But as I say, the lens hood is useful on this. For a lot of wide lenses like this, lens hoods are not much use at all because any shift and they show up and you can't adjust them. Whereas this one, you can rotate it and shift it. So not a difficult problem there. Now, let's have a look at shift because that's what you would get this lens for. Here's a view of a building taken with the camera level. No shift setting, this is probably about f8 i say probably because as i said there's no exif data so i can't tell you and unless you're methodical enough to actually write down what your settings were for every single shot you're never going to know you can probably guess from the exposure and what you generally use but you don't know for certain so there's a picture of building with no shift the camera is level the verticals are fine there's you know everything's straight one of the reasons you use shift is because if you point a camera upwards like this, you'll get convergence of verticals. Converging verticals tend to look, it's that building's falling over look that you don't really want. So there's a shot with the camera level, no shift. Here's a shot with a bit of shift. You see, I've shifted the lens upwards and it's the act, shift axis is up down. I've moved it and it's shifted the lens upwards. I've not moved the camera at all, so I've shifted it upwards. We've now got a better composition, less of the grass in the front here, and a more even picture of it. This is one of the reasons you use lenses like this for architecture, because they stop leaning buildings, they stop the verticals from leaning in. Of course, you do have to level your camera up carefully for it. And if I go to the next one, this is at full shift, you can see there's quite a range of shift. I just go back through those. No shift, some shift, full shift. There's lots of shift there. Uh, it's a useful amount. Um, 
you needn't worry too much about uh, lens quality falling off, obviously, if you've got sky in the corners, because it doesn't make that much difference. But if you've got building detail or subject detail, using it for interiors, you do have to be a bit more careful at full shift. A bit of downward shift. This is handheld, uh, just using the level in the camera. And I've kept the camera level. I've shifted the lens downwards a little bit, just so I can see a bit more of what's on the ground here that I wanted to show. There's the building that was uh, photographed earlier, the three examples of it. There we go, we've got some vertical shift. So we've got the vertical lines are all straight here. The building leans out. There we go, just perfectly ordinary shot using just enough vertical shift to get the composition I want. But I could actually take a couple of pictures, I could take, take more than that. I could take one like this and one with the lens shifted downwards. What you can do is then stitch those together and I've got a composite image between two images, one shifted up, one shifted down. This gives you a much bigger field of view, gives you a square image like this. It works very well. Um, I would say there is a slight issue in technically, when you're doing the shift up and down, the lens is moving and that changes the viewpoint slightly. So you could potentially get parallax problems. Now, with an up-down shift like this and knowing what's in front of me, there are no obvious parallax problems with this. The way around that is either to keep the front of the lens fixed, I'm not sure how you do that immediately, but move the camera back. One way to do that is if you do shift one direction, you move the camera on the tripod the same amount the opposite direction can be a bit of faffing around to get it right, particularly with up-down movements. Now, I'm told that Lauer are bringing out a specialist mount for the lens that allows the lens to be clamped in place and the camera shifted. And this will completely eliminate parallax. Worth looking at, wasn't available when I got this lens for testing before the release. I'm hoping to have a look at it before long and I'll do a video and a review showing how it works uh, when I do get a chance to have a look at it. But stitching images, potentially very powerful usage of shift. You could of course shift left and right and get a wide panoramic view. Um, this is just a vertical shift. Lots of different ways you can do shift. Another example, I'm looking at this building. I'm square onto the building. So this, so that not only are the verticals true, but the horizontal lines on this building in the distance are also horizontal. It's called single point projection. Um, it, it's just a way of looking at things. Uh, it's quite, I know when I'm doing shots, if I include a few of these, architects like it because it's similar to the plans and the drawings. It gives a square on look. But obviously where I am here, if I were to tilt the camera upwards, I would get converging verticals. And if I didn't want as much of this brown building, I would get the horizontal lines would also converge to a point off to the side. So what do we do? Well, I can add some vertical shift and I've now got the entire building in. But I've got too much of this brown building. I don't really want this much of this brown building in it. So what we've, we've got, so I've shift up, but what about rather than shift up, I shift sideways or diagonal shift. Now diagonal shift, and this is one that even a lot of people who are used to using tilt and shift lenses have a little bit more thinking to get the head around is that diagonal shift does that. So we've got the combination of the vertical shift and the sideways shift. The two of them together make for a diagonal shift. And you do that by pressing this little tab on here and you set the axis to where you want it. And I say it's 15 degree click stops on this. Um, you can set it between them, but 15 degree click stops. Please Canon and Nikon, when you bring out new tilt shift lenses, 15 degree clicks, please, not the 30 degree ones you've used for years. 15 degrees are so much more useful than 30 degrees, mainly because 45 degrees is divisible by 15. 
whereas on the Canon Nikon ones, you only get 0, 30, 60, 90 steps. So if you want 45, you have to sort of guess it. So yeah, one bit that Lauer have very definitely got right on the lenses there, 15 degree click stops. Uh, so there's a diagonal shot of it. As I say, diagonally, the detail falls off, obviously in this top corner here. Uh, it's, it's where the lowest image quality is. For sky like this, doesn't make much difference. If I had building detail in it, I might need to go to F16, F11, 16. Smaller than you might consider using normally, but you're getting detail over the whole picture rather than just towards the middle. There's another example of using diagonal shift and um, I'm shifting that direction, the lens. The camera is actually looking down this walkway down the side of the building. That's the direction the camera and lens is pointing, but it's been shifted that way by shifting the lens upwards. You can see in this, and this is at f8, you can see there is a bit of darkening over here from a bit of the natural vignetting of the lens. At f11 it would have been less visible, but I wanted to test with this one. I wanted to see what the sharpness of the lens is like. It's pretty good. Brickwork like this will show up issues. Now, the brickwork is softer up in this area here. But I found that modern sharpening tools, things like Sharpen AI, and I go into this more in the written version of the review. If I look at things like that, I find they sharpen up images like this really well. But at the cost of even on a moderately fast computer, taking five, 10 minutes to do the processing for it. So you want to think twice whether you really want to use that. Now, that's diagonal shift. Here's another interesting use of shift. This also comes with the horizontal shift um, in playing around with perspective. Here we have a picture. The lens has been shifted upwards to get the verticals true. And the lens has been shifted across diagonally. So I'm actually in this particular picture here the camera is pointing roughly towards this little brick building down here. Next, I get rid of the diagonal bit of shift and just have vertical shift. So this is now straight looking at the corner of this building here. I haven't moved the camera tripod at all. All I've changed is the amount of shift and where I'm pointing the camera. And lastly, I've now got shift to the other direction. This is shift to the left. So I'm now pointing the camera over here towards this little tree. Now, if you look at the examples on the website, you'll be able to look at them in more detail. You can see from the alignment of the lamppost and the sign on the front of the gallery here that the view is exactly the same. All I've done is change the amount of left-right shift. I've got vertical shift to correct the verticals. Left, right plus verticals is a diagonal. So we've got diagonal one way, just up, diagonal the other way. I just go back through those. So these three shots are taken from the same position, just using left, right shift to control the apparent perspective. Now, the only way you can change perspective, true perspective, is to look from a different place. But in these ones, I'm actually changing it on the fly. Just something you can play around with. Right, well, I'll leave it with that. As, an, as a lens, I enjoyed using it. It is solid. It focused well. You do need to pay care in focusing uh, because I noticed that uh, the, it doesn't go past infinity on the stop here, but the hard stop may need altering a little bit. So you might need to decide your best focus position. Um, I know there's an app at depth of field scale here, but like on all lenses, they're there for show, or at least I've long regarded that. Uh, you have a huge depth of field with this if you stop down. It's a 20 millimeter lens. Great lens to use. Have a look at the written review. I've got lots more photo examples. You can zoom in on them. As I said, there is the long video that I've done, which is the webinar, recording of the webinar I produced, that's available on the YouTube channel. There's an entire playlist related to using tilt and shift lenses. Ah, tilt and shift. I mentioned this was tilt only, is uh, shift only, is that a problem? I'm gonna say no, 
because I so, I use my day-to-day -day work. I have Canon 17 millimeter, Canon 24 millimeter tilt shift lenses. Both of those, I use tilt so rarely, particularly with the 17, that were you to take the tilt off my TSE 17, I'd not be terribly worried. Were you to take it off the 24, well, that would be a minor irritation because I do occasionally use it. If I was using this, I would say over 99% of the photos I take, if this had tilt as well, 99% of them would use shift, well below 1% would use tilt. So yeah, it's shift only. I'm gonna say, so what? Um, if you like tilt that much, you'll know about using tilt and you'll know how to use it uh, and you'll be happy with that. And you won't be looking at a lens like this. This is a great lens for people doing landscape architecture interiors. Um, yeah, nice lens. Thanks to Lower for lending it me. As I do have a look at the uh, written stuff as well. Please subscribe to the channel if you find it useful. And if you've got any questions, please do ask because I'm hoping to do a few more short videos with this uh, lens as well and fit those in together.